So glad you're here today. You probably noticed more and more changes as you come into the lobby area. Somebody last service wanted to know if all of that different kind of carpet was the new motif. No, it's not. It's, it's what, uh, what was actually donated so that we could cover up the concrete so you'd be safe today. But uh, every day there's a little more progress and so we appreciate what God is doing. We appreciate all the work that's being done and the folks that are working do a remarkable job, not just on making the facility what it's going to be, but in making sure we have access to it on Sunday. So we just say thank you to them this morning for all the work that they put in on that. So this morning we're going to talk about uh, conversations again, and our conversations particularly with God. And what's true is that not every conversation is of equal value. There are some people who mean more to us, and there are some topics that have greater gravity. Uh, there are before and after moments in our lives when our life is dramatically changed by a single conversation. It might be someone expressing their love. It might be someone telling us that the relationship is over. It might be a doctor saying that life is about to get very, very different or very, very short. Conversations have a way of having significant impact on our life. So Jesus talked about the kind of conversation we could have with our Heavenly Father. And uh, as I read through this this morning, we're going to get to the section that is the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is actually will be in yellow type on the screen. And so when we get there, I'd like us all to say that out loud and together. Are you willing to help me out with that? All right. So what it says here is Jesus is saying, when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Let's all say this out loud and together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Everyone prays. Everyone prays, maybe for different things and maybe to different gods. But it seems to be an instinct in the human heart. If you see something that's beautiful enough, the words, oh my God, just seem to come out. Every culture and every language seems to express that. And if things get challenging enough, painful enough, heavy enough, hopeless enough, hard enough, you'll find yourself having a conversation with someone that you've never seen and are not sure is there but you'll ask for help. And since every human prays, there's a lot of assumptions about prayer. Some people think that prayer is like a magic formula. If you say something in the right way, with the right tone, in the right words, that just kind of unlocks a door for something to happen. Other people see prayer as kind of the emergency only option. You know, just you pull the fire alarm or you dial 911, but only in the case of an emergency. Jesus actually begins this section of his teaching by dismantling some of the human assumptions about prayer. And the first thing he tells us is that prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not a performance. Some people focus on how they look and who is looking. In fact, we just all read the Lord's Prayer out loud and together. And I noticed that the room was filled with these words that are to be directed to God. But if I asked everyone right now to pray your own words, the sound would be quite different. 
it would actually be quite a bit less. And the reason is often we're concerned about what people will hear or what they will think about how we pray. Yeah. So concerned about who looks and, and how we look. And Jesus said, if your primary concern is who is looking and how you look, then your answer to your prayer is actually to be seen. And that will be your prayer answered in full. So he tells us that there's a way to offset our tendency to try to manage our image in front of other people. And what he says is, try a private option in prayer. It's not a prohibition of a public prayer option. He's just saying that if you want to make sure the way you're saying and what you're saying is not influenced by trying to manage your impression, just get into a place where it's only you and God. And then he says this, prayer is not enhanced by more words. You probably took a class where you had to turn in an essay or a term paper, and there was a minimum number of words required. And if you were like me, you made your margins as wide as possible and used as much spacing as possible, and I counted even my name towards the word count because I know you're surprised. You would think I would have a lot of words left over, but not so much back then. Sorry for you now. God doesn't actually count the words. Jesus indicates that what God is more interested than the number of words that are spoken is what we're expressing in our heart or from our heart. That it is really possible for people to say words without even thinking. We do it all the time. You know, it, you'll go into the doctor for a an appointment, and, and someone will walk in the office and ask you how you're doing, and you will tell them you are fine, which they know is an automatic response, or they would look at you and go, well, then why are you here? <laughs> we used to teach our children a prayer. How many, how many, when you were a child growing up, they, they taught you how to pray, now I lay me down to sleep, yes? Which I think is an absolutely terrifying prayer to teach children. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonder they ever sleep, you know? Have you ever listened to the words? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Like, kids will just look at you and go, that could happen? <laughs> so so we, we reauthored the language of that. And so what we taught them was, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Thy love stay with me through the night and wake me with the morning light. Isn't that better? <laughs> it is. But you know what we, we would find ourselves saying as parents, you know, it's time for bed. Go in, wash your face, your hands, brush your teeth, get into bed. Say your prayers. Say your prayers, which is a very different thing than praying. Jesus actually understands that any time we disengage our heart and our mind from the words coming out of our mouth, that it's not necessarily a, a spiritually healthy thing. And so he challenges us. This isn't about a word count. It's not about how long you can go or how much you can say, but it's about how honest you're willing to be. It's, it's not just a button that we push. It's a journey that we take. And in a real prayer, you learn a lot about God and about yourself. And prayer is not just a way to get what we want. Real prayer is a way for us to experience what God wants. And to our surprise, he wants much better things than we do. It's not a force to be manipulated. It's a conversation to be enjoyed. Quite different. So prayer will do a couple of things. Prayer will change your assumptions. We all have a set of assumptions about God, about our world, about ourselves. And prayer just changes our assumptions. God gets blamed for just about everything that bad that happens in this world. And if he's, out not, if he's not outright blamed for it, people will say, well, at least he could have done something about it, and he didn't. The, the interesting thing about God's will is the will of God doesn't eliminate the free will of people. I wish I could tell you that your choice only matters as long as you do the right thing, but that's not true. We all have real choice, and there are real consequences for the choices that we make. We can have assumptions about the, ourselves and the role that we play in, in our world. We, we can assume that there's nothing we can do. We have no options to exercise. 
our, our resources, our time, our wisdom, it's all limited, which is true. But just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we can't do something. Maybe God wants to partner with us in a way we hadn't anticipated. When we pray, we recognize that something isn't right. That's the primary reason people do pray. Something's not right. But our assumption can be, and there's nothing I can do about it. What difference does it make? That's the common phrase of our world, to eliminate any response in any situation. We know something's not right. But we can ask God's order to be brought to the, to the disorder of human frailty and failing. We have options to exercise. We can also have assumptions about others. People are not just speed bumps that are slowing us down from what we really want in life or access ramps to what we really want in life. Every single person you and I ever come in contact with, God has an eternal purpose for them, even if it's not obvious or they're not living it out right now. It's amazing what God can use them to bring into your lives and to teach you in life. And it's amazing how God can use you to do the same for them. When we see people only as problems, it's evidence that we haven't prayed for them yet. So, so prayer will change your assumptions. Prayer will also challenge your priorities. Prayer will challenge your priorities. Uh, I'm sure you heard stories about magic lamps growing up where some person finds this lamp and in their effort to clean it up, a genie comes out and grants them three wishes. And in all those stories, it just goes badly. Because we assume we know what we want and if we get what we want, our lives will be better. We assume it will all go well, but our desires can actually be quite clouded and conflicted. There are things that we want that will actually wreck our lives, and when we get what we ask for, sometimes it goes badly. The good news is, is that God won't allow us to have something like that. It's easy to assume that the, that the only thing that, that I can see in my lifetime is the only thing that matters. I, I wonder if it was possible, if it would be possible for God to use you to participate in something your eyes would never see, that it would be that far out and that far away. And you would never see it, but it could really matter. And the question is, well, how would you know? And the answer is prayer. What if things in our world are actually not as they're supposed to be? What if God actually wants to alter events and circumstances? And what if prayer is the way that happens? So he calls us to prayer. So prayer connects us with the one who knows us best and loves us most. That's the primary thing. Jesus starts with two words that just set the whole tone for everything that father, fo uh, follows. And that is our father. He doesn't say my, my father. He doesn't say just your father. Our. We're in this together. Father. And, and that concept of father indicates that God knows you, that he considers himself responsible for you. We, we raised two children in our house. We knew them reasonably well, and we felt not just concerned for them or about them, but we felt a responsibility to them. Just think about that. God knows everything there is to know about you. God loves you more than anyone else in the entire universe, and God has a sense of responsibility to you. He knows you. The second thing that I want you to see is that prayer is the way God's will is released in our world. Prayer is the way God's uh, will is released in our world. This is what he teaches us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is heaven because God's will is always done there. This is not heaven because there are things that happen here that God did not purpose or intend or desire or create. There are broken things that God would actually like to heal. There are dark things that God would like to expose. There are, there are blessings that God wants to release. So the answer is to pray. God doesn't impose anything on us, but we can invite the resources of heaven to flow into our lives and into the lives of those we love. Prayer is not a way to escape reality. Prayer is a way to fully engage reality. 
There are things that we will go through in our life that are so painful and so hard, we will feel like we have really only a couple of options. One is to avoid them, or the other is to endure them. And some people think that's the only options that we have. What if in prayer you had another option, not just to avoid or just to endure, but to actually invade that problem with the grace of God and the power of God and the wisdom of God and the love of God? How phenomenal that would be. Maybe the God who can do anything actually wants to do something. And he's waiting for us to invite him. Our world is paralyzed by fear. It's bound with all kinds of addictions. People are dehumanized through injustice and they're diminished by poverty. Death breaks our hearts and our relationships. Sickness wears us down and erodes our body. And the question is, the question is, will you find your voice? Would you be willing to invite for the resources of heaven to be released in our world? One more thing about prayer is that it actually allows for imagination. It allows for imagination. Some of us have better imaginations than others. By the way, I think all of us actually have pretty good imaginations. Some of us just only imagine the bad things that could happen. But this is what it says in Ephesians 3. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or... Yeah. Uh, What happens? What could happen if God's grace were released into a situation without restriction? What would it look like if God's power were released into a situation? What would it look like if God's love penetrated every barrier in a situation that we were aware of. If we can imagine what God's grace and God's power and God's love could do in a situation, it encourages us to pray. And what I want you to know is that imagination and that request doesn't limit God in any way. God can do above and beyond what we ask or imagine. So dare to ask. Our problem, our problem is not unanswered prayer. Our problem is unprayed prayer. We just don't ask. Every problem is too big if your God is too small. You can bring anything to him. Now, I know when things go on, we can wonder if God cares. And we can have a hard time imagining a different outcome than what we have seen and are unable to unsee. But God calls us into this opportunity of prayer. And, and it's not, not all prayers are answered instantly. In fact, most prayers are not answered instantly. But this is what I want you to hear. And I believe this to the core of my being. I'm convinced of this more than anything else that I can talk to you about. And that is the outcome of every situation. The outcome of every situation is different when we have prayed than if we had not prayed. The outcome of every situation is different when we have prayed than if we had not prayed. I'm not saying we get exactly what we ask for, but the moment prayer is brought to bear into a situation, the outcome is influenced by God. Every time, no exceptions. Now, God's priority in a situation is likely to be different than our own priority. But even while we are praying, God begins to do a deep work within us. Long-term prayer assignments can actually help us, our focus to be expanded. Our tendency is to be a little bit short-sighted. We tend to focus on the the most urgent and, and closest things to us in time. But there may be some longer issues and some deeper issues that God wants to address. And so over time, our focus gets expanded and our goals can be adjusted. We don't always pray God's will. But over time, we can gain a lot of clarity on what God wants to do in a situation. And our motives can be purified because sometimes we want things that are not healthy for us. And sometimes we want good things for unhealthy reasons. Prayer is a way of bringing those things to the surface, and they're dealt with. So every single week in this series on conversations, I've been talking about 
setting up a five-minute-a-day prayer assignment just to, to help us have these conversations with God. And so here's some recommendations that I, that I have for you. And, and on every one of these points, as we talk about this point, there's someone who may come to your mind. And I just want you to jot their first name down to your notes, next to your notes. All right, first name down next to your notes. So who do you know that is ill or has been injured that you could pray for healing for? They're ill or they're injured. And, and by the way, that injury might be something more than just a physical thing. There are all kinds of injuries people can go through. So just take a half a second, and if, you, if someone comes to your mind, just jot their name down real quick. And then, who do you know that is struggling with a lack of resources? You can pray for provision. And by the way, provision is not always a check showing up or cash showing up. Sometimes it's an, a door of opportunity that's open. And now there's an option for income that didn't exist before. And so who do you know that's struggling in terms of resources that God could provide for? And then thirdly, who do you know that seems caught in life-controlling behaviors that seem limiting and restricting? You could pray for freedom. The, the most obvious thing here has to do with addictions. And what I will tell you is that we, we have a culture of addiction. What we have discovered it is it is possible to be addicted to almost anything. It's unbelievable. But it's not limited to that. Sometimes we are caught in ways of thinking that actually close doors of opportunity or at least keep us from walking through them. There are things that we have believed about ourselves Maybe we told ourselves those things or someone else told us those things and it doesn't matter what door God opens. We will never walk through it. We're caught. We're trapped. Something hinders our ability to take advantage of the doors that God opens. So if there's anybody that comes to your mind like that, just, just jot their, their first name down next to your notes. And then who do you know that is at risk? You can pray for their protection. I, I know a young person who's heading into a conversation that is a high-risk conversation because of the family's willingness to, to share some things with me. I understand how high-risk the conversation can be. And the easiest thing in the world is just to say, so, so don't do that. But there are things that we need to face in life. There are conversations that we need to step into. There are things that we need to say and we need to hear. And the risk is real. It's not imagined. It's not, pretend, it's not an excuse to avoid. It's a true thing. And so there's ways to walk wisely as possible into those situations. But we can also pray for protection. Something that we can do. These are things that we can all pray. Prayer is actually, prayer is the way we treat God as God. Where we seek his wisdom and his will. And we recognize our own limitations. It's one of the best ways to actually recognize God as God. Prayer is what wars against the status quo of what is dark and evil in our world. It's, it's the only thing that stands up to it. The world we live in could be different than we see right now if we were willing to pray. What could our world look like if we were willing to pray? Let's bow our heads this morning. I, I do know that um, the larger the issue that we're praying about, the greater the need, the more urgent something feels, the more disqualified we feel for it.
one minute in prayer can bring more reasons to your mind about why God shouldn't pay any attention to you than, than almost any other exercise you could engage in. That's why we spent as long as we did last week talking about how to start those conversations where we're not hiding anything from God. Would you please hear this this morning? Is it God willing, God's willingness to, to act on our behalf God's willingness to open the windows of heaven and flow out such mercy and power and grace that it staggers our imagination and it changes everything around us. His willingness to do that is not based on our goodness, but on his. Your heavenly Father has wonderful things that he wants to release into your life. Ask. Ask boldly. Ask bravely. Ask courageously. Ask largely. Ask continually. He's not offended by your request. Our world is desperate for grace and God's power. So Father, Help us find the courage and the words. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand with me this morning?